Hello, welcome to your online lecture for the course Anatomy and Physiology. In today's lecture, we're covering physiology or function of the muscular system. We're going to talk about the three different types of muscles that are found in the human body. We'll look at how muscles work, so we will be specifically looking at one particular type of muscle tissue. And we'll look at reflexes, and then we'll finish up the lecture by talking about the energy needed for muscle contraction and how it forms. On this slide, you can three, see three different types of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and cardiac muscle tissue. Starting with skeletal. Skeletal muscle is also known as striated because it has these alternating bands of thick and thin filaments, as you can see if you look closely in this image. And so it gives it a, almost a striped looking appearance. Skeletal muscle is considered voluntary because we have control over contraction and relaxation of our skeletal muscles. We can decide if we're going to lift a weight, for example, and contract our muscles to be able to do that. Skeletal muscle contains, contains many nuclei per cell. So remember that a muscle cell is called a muscle fiber, and so skeletal muscle then are multinucleated within each cell. Smooth muscle tissue is, con is considered non-striated because it's smooth in appearance and doesn't contain the same striations that you can see throughout here. Sc smooth muscle is considered involuntary because it is found within organs such as our stomach, within our intestines, within our blood vessels. It's part of our autonomic nervous system, which means that it's not under voluntary control. We'll see an image of it shortly so that you can see that the cells look very almost elongated and narrowed. They take on a tapered look appearance. And they only have one nucleus per cell. And that means that they're called, that they're uninucleated. Cardiac muscle is also considered striated. This, the striated patterns are a little bit different in the way that they're organized compared to muscle tissue. And cardiac muscle will be looked at in a little bit more detail once we get to the cardiovascular system unit. But cardiovascular, or sorry, cardiac muscle, as you can imagine, is involuntary. We don't have direct control over the contraction of our heart, which needs to beat all of the time to keep us alive. Now, in certain cases of stress or excitement or emergencies, your heart might be fat, beat faster, or in other cases, it might beat slower, but we aren't actually having direct control over that happening. Cardiac muscle contains a special feature where it has these branching cells with intercalated discs, and what this allows for is really fast communication between all of the heart muscle cells because we want our heart to be able to respond very quickly and be able to work in a very synchronized fashion. So this slide shows some of the similarities and differences between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. Both are striated, as mentioned on the last slide, and this is because they both contain what are called myofibrils. Remember, myo means muscle. They also contain T-tubules, as well as a sarcoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk about these shortly, but as a brief introduction, T-tubules, which you can see in this image here, are kind of like a pocket that's found within the plasma membrane. And what will happen when, as you'll see, when a nerve impulse travels along a muscle is it's going to travel down the T-tubule in order to get a little bit deeper into the muscle. There's also a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Think of a sarcoplasmic reticulum as being a specialized type of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which you should remember from the beginning of the term. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart. Cardiac is referring to heart. And it really forms the bulk of the wall of each chamber, meaning that most of our heart is actually made up of muscle. It also forms a continuous contractile band around each of our heart's chambers. We have four chambers in our heart. And what this allows for is that one single nerve impulse can travel throughout the entire muscle to allow for a coordinated muscle contraction. And as introduced on the last slide, there's branching seen within the muscle fibers and that allows as well for quick and fast communication between cells. But the T-tubules in cardiac muscle, they're larger and they form what are called dyads. So you can see here that a dyad is where we have the T-tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum together. 
And this really plays an important role in the, what we can call excitation contraction coupling that occurs within the heart. Cardiac muscle also has what's called a synchysium. And that's this term here. And what this is, is it means it has the ability to conduct an electrical activity from one cell to the other without having individual nerves innervating each part of the heart muscle. So if we have a heart here, and most of it is all of this muscle wrapped around in different directions, instead of having a nerve innervate here and a nerve innervate here and here and so on and so forth, because of this synchysium, it means that we can have a nerve impulse generated that will just spread throughout the entire heart, allowing it to contract efficiently and powerfully. Let's look at cardiac muscle versus skeletal muscle in a little bit more detail. And we're looking more here at function, some of the differences in function. In terms of length of impulse, Skeletal muscle will have a very short impulse length. And you can see in this graph here, blue is representing the skeletal muscle impulse, that it happens really, really quickly and then drops down. And this feature can, can lead to what's called tetanus. And in physiology, tetanus is the prolonged contraction of a muscle caused by, a rapidly, by rapidly repeated stimuli. Whereas cardiac muscle, it's a much longer length of impulse, and you can see that happening here, much longer. And so it, it, it cannot come on rapidly enough in order to produce that tetanus that we just discussed. In terms of ATP supply, our skeletal muscles will deplete it really quickly. And that will make sense if you think about if you're working out your muscles, how tired they can get. And that's because our ATP supplies are starting to store and are being depleted and we're starting to fatigue. Whereas with cardiac muscle, it's continuously produced. And so we don't have fatigue. And this is important because we constantly need our heart to pump all of the time. In terms of a stimulus, Skeletal muscle requires a trigger from the neuromuscular junction, and that will make a lot more sense shortly when we discuss this particular feature. But cardiac muscle, as we'll learn in the cardi cardiovascular system unit, is self-stimulating, meaning that it has the ability to generate its own action potential. So if here's our heart here, and we have four different chambers, there's a specialized structure called the SA node that we'll learn about in another lecture, and that can generate its own action potential, which can cause it to spread throughout the heart. And then as already mentioned, skeletal muscle can fatigue, has the ability to lead to fatigue, whereas our cardiac muscle, it needs to contract rhythmically and continuously because our, all of our, every single tissue and cell in our body requires that it's getting a constant blood flow. So it's getting the nutrients and oxygen it needs to survive. And you can see comparing skeletal muscle to cardiac muscle contraction, the earlier drop off. So the third type of muscle is called smooth muscle. And so we spoke about skeletal and cardiac. Let's look a little bit on about smooth muscle and then compare it to skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle tissue also contains the thick and thin filaments. And we'll be talking a lot about these thick and thin filaments in upcoming slides, but we'll be discussing them as they pertain to skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle, some of the differences. Well, it looks smooth, hence the name. And the reason for that is because the thick and thin filaments are arranged differently than they are in skeletal or cardiac muscle fibers. And in skeletal or cardiac muscle fibers, they give the appearance of striation, but smooth muscle doesn't have that. In terms of how the cells look, well, here's an image of the cell. You can see that there's a single nuclei or single nucleus, which we talked about earlier, and it's tapered at the ends. It does not possess any T-tubules. It doesn't even have a sarcomere, so it doesn't have that contractile unit that we introduced. And its sarcoplasmic reticulum, which remember is a sort of a variation of a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, is loosely organized. Another important feature that 
will make a lot more sense once we go into it today is that calcium is important for muscle contraction. And in skeletal muscle, as you'll see shortly, this calcium is stored within the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then released from there to contribute to a muscle contraction. But with smooth muscle, the calcium actually isn't residing in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Instead, it comes from outside the cell. Normally with skeletal muscle, when calcium is released, it will bind to something called troponin. But it's different in smooth muscle. Instead, calcium that comes from the outside of the cell will instead bound, bound, bind to what's called calmodulin rather than troponin. We won't be going into detail about this in this lecture in terms of the contractions of smooth muscles. But smooth muscles and understanding them and being familiar with them is really important because most upcoming lectures will at some point mention smooth muscle because it lines so many different organs within our body. So we'll bring it up when we talk about the digestive system, the respiratory system, the urinary system, and so on and so forth. So the rest of today's lecture is going to be covering skeletal muscle cells rather than talking about smooth and cardiac. In terms of some of its characteristics, it has the ability to be excited or uh, what we can call irritability. And this means that it can be stimulated by a nerve, but also respond to that nerve signal. Skeletal muscles also have the ability to contract. And when they contract, this means that they will shorten and they will create movement. They also possess the ability to be extensible meaning that they can extend or we could say stretch and this will allow for relaxation. So you can see that these are opposite events. We have contractility and then extensibility. In terms of function, skeletal muscle can pull on bones to create movement. It can also pull on other muscles. For example, the face. We talked about how skeletal muscles found within the face can pull on bone. They can also pull on fascia. They can pull on other muscles. And so skeletal muscle can move maybe specific areas of the body or it can move the body entirely. Skeletal, skeletal muscle also has the ability to produce heat. And this allows for maintenance of homeostasis. So when you think about when you're outside and you're cold and you start shivering, that's your muscles contracting in order to warm up your body by producing heat. And so this is done by, this heat production is done by a process called catabolism. Our skeletal muscles also contribute to our posture by having this continual partial contraction of certain skeletal muscles to allow us to do things such as sitting, standing or even just staying still all requires muscle activity. So we've looked at the anatomy of a skeletal muscle to some extent already and we pretty much covered everything from here to here. And what we spoke about is that this structure here represents a fascicle which is filled with a whole bunch of different muscle fibers. Remember muscle fibers are the muscle cells. If we were to pull out a fascicle, we can see that here, we can look at the muscle fibers even closer. Now, if we were to pull out just one muscle fiber, now we're looking at a new area. We can pull out this muscle fiber and we can see what's actually contained within the muscle fiber now. So we're getting even deeper. So myofibrils, showing here the blue and pink structures, they're very fine fibers and they're very closely packed together and they're found within the sarcoplasm of the cell. The sarcoplasm, I want you to think of this as referring to almost like the cytoplasm of another cell, but it's called the sarcoplasm for muscle cells. And as you can see, they extend lengthwise and they contain within them what they're made up of are myofilaments. So don't mix up the term myofibril with the term myofilaments. We can say that myofibrils contain myofilaments. Another feature for you to be aware of before we start talking about the actual process of contraction is what's called a sarcomere. And a sarcomere, if you can see this structure right here, this is called a Z-disc. And we'll see this again shortly. And the Z-disc, from one Z-disc 
to another Z disc is referred to as a sarcomere. So it's a segment of myofibrils between two successive Z discs. And again, here is one sarcomere. And it has the ability to shorten. So it's called the contractile unit of the muscle fiber. So what will happen then is this region will move in this direction. This part will move in this direction, causing an overall shortening in the sarcomere when it contracts. And we'll see what that looks like shortly. And this will actually happen not just with this sarcomere, but with this sarcomere and the next sarcomere in order to contribute to an overall contraction. So now let's look at myofilaments. Remember that myofibrils contain myofilaments and each myofibril will contain thousands of thick and thin myofilaments. And there are four different kinds of proteins that make up these myofilaments. Myosin, actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. Let's start with myosin. Myosin is the thick filament. And if we look at the image, you can see that, that we have this filament here, or this whole structure, and we have this here. You can see just by looking at the image which one is thicker. So myosin then is the thick filament. And it's made up of myosin heads. So these are all myosin heads that you can see throughout. And these heads, as we'll see shortly, are going to be attracted to this filament, which is called, this is actin here. So the heads will be attracted to actin at the appropriate time. And what they will do at that appropriate time is they'll bind to specific sites that are found on actin, forming what's called a cross bridge once it attaches but we'll look at that process shortly. Actin, this is the thin filament, and you can see that it's these two fibrous strands that have wrapped around each other, and they contain very special sites called active sites. And you can't see the active sites on this strand because they are covered by tropomyosin. So underneath tropomyosin, are all of these active sites. And actually you can sort of see it there. But when the muscle's relaxed, all of these active sites are covered. When they're exposed, as you'll see shortly, that's when the myosin head will bind to it. But again, when it's relaxed, these will be covered. So then that leads us nicely to talking about tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is that this strand that you can see that actually blocks those active sites on the thin filament, which is actin, and this happens when the muscle is relaxed. Troponin. This is a protein that you can see in yellow, and it's because of this structure that tropomyosin can stay where it is. So this structure here, troponin, when it moves, it will pull with it the tropomyosin so it exposes these active sites, as we'll see shortly. Think back to the beginning when I told you that skeletal muscle is also called striated muscle. And what we're going to look at now is what actually makes up that appearance that we can see. You can see all the striations occurring here. What makes up all of these striations? So you can see light bands, dark bands, light bands, dark bands, alternating. So let's start with the dark, the dark stripes. What are the dark stripes made up of? Well, if you look at this image here, you can see that the thicker filament, myosin, in blue, and you can see the thinner filament here in pink. And you can see that they overlap. So the dark stripes that you see on this image are actually made up of what's called an A-band. And the A-band, you can see, runs from here to here. And if you look in between, you can see it contains some thin filaments and it also contains thick filaments. And it contributes again to the darker region. You can see here it's much more dense, this region, so it comes up as appearing darker because there's more there. Next up, we have the H-band. The H-band, as you can see here, runs across the midsection of each of the dark a bands that we just spoke about. So here's the dark A band and running right in the center is the H band. 
And this, you can hopefully visualize, contains only the thick filaments. But the, what's important to know is that this is only at rest. So when this sarcomere shortens, so here's a Z-disc, and here's another Z-disc, which we know makes one sarcomere. When it shortens, so it's moving in this direction, in some cases, the H-band is just going to disappear or hardly be visible as it shortens. So at rest, we can visibly see it containing all of the thick filaments. Next up, we have the M-line. You can see that the M-line is found right here. And this M-line with M-protein is going to stabilize the thick filaments, keeping them where they're supposed to be. Now, we spoke about the dark stripes. Now let's talk about the light stripes. They're called the I-bands. And you can see how lighter it is here, how much less dense it is. So when, it, when you see it on when you see the actual muscle, you can see that it gives this lighter appearance than the dark bands. So we know then that the I band is going to contain thin filaments, but it also contains the Z disc. Okay, Z disc and the thin filament. Next up is the Z disc, which we've already mentioned. So you can see the Z disc here. It's because it has this zigzag looky appearance. And it's found pretty much right in the middle of each of these lighter I bands. So you can see the Z disc found in the middle of this I band. And as I mentioned to you earlier, it's the boundary between adjacent sarcomeres. So what that means is that if we have a Z disc here and this Z disc here, that's one sarcomere. From this Z disc here, to the next one is also going to be one sarcomere, and each sarcomere will contract. And T tubules, these are located between the A band and the I band, so they would run, say, inward around here. So it's these tubular systems. And so what will happen is, for example, when a nerve impulse is traveling along a muscle, it's going to go down the T tubules. And what we'll see happen shortly is it will signal the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is involved in the muscle contraction. And this image nicely shows you that between the light and the dark bands, we have a T-tubule. This one here actually being the lighter I band and this one here being the darker A band, but you can see that tubule running in between them. And so as the nerve impulse travels along, it would dip down into the T tubules and it will stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so all of this region through here, to release its calcium. Some features that we can see that are important to be aware of is that there are many mitochondria. So if you're looking at this image, you can see the presence of so many different mitochondria within the cell. You can see there's also, well, you can only see one nucleus in this case, but we know that there are going to be numerous nuclei because skeletal muscle is multinucleated. The sarcolemma, think of this as just being like the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. So what we knew of as a plasma membrane of normal other cells in the body, it's called a sarcolemma. And then remember the sarcoplasm is like the cytoplasm of the cell. And here's that term sarcoplasmic reticulum. It is a series of sacs, which you can see all through here. You can see it running up through here in yellow. They contain calcium, which is required for muscle contraction. We'll come back to that. T tubules, they also take on the name transverse tubules because of the direction that they run. And so as you know, there are these inward extensions. They're actually extensions of the sarcolemma. So here's our sarcolemma running on the outside. So they're extensions of the sarcolemma. And as I already told you, they allow for an electrical impulse to travel along the sarcolemma and then move deeper down into the muscle cell to trigger sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium. The term triad refers to 
the combination of this T tubule, which you can see, so one T tubule, and then a sarcoplasmic reticulum that runs on either side. So here's another triad, these three, and another triad here, these three. So as the electrical impulse travels along the sarcolemma of the cell, it's going to dip down into the T-tubule, and then it's able to stimulate, because of its close proximity, the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its content, which is calcium. So let's look at the importance of calcium. When a muscle is in its relaxed state, calcium isn't released. Calcium instead, as we know, is going to be stored within the sarcoplasmic reticulum of these skeletal muscle cells. So if we look up at this image here, I wanted to point out to you the presence of all of these little structures here that are calcium. And they're, they're stored within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But you can also see that there's these heavily, there are areas of heavily concentrated calcium ions. And almost like they're there are a whole bunch of people waiting outside the door of a shopping mall that has a big sale so that they can rush out. They sequester in one area. And they can sequester because of what's called calsequestrin. So this will concentrate calcium right around those doors or what we actually call calcium channels. And these calcium channels are voltage gated. And this means that there has to be some sort of a change in voltage or a change in the potential difference across the membrane in order for them to be opened and activated. And so what will cause this change in potential or this voltage is going to be the actual impulse, the nerve impulse that reaches the muscle. So when these gates open, these voltage gated calcium channels open, they're going to allow for calcium that's within the sarcoplasmic reticulum to leave. Then once that calcium is used for muscle contraction, then it's going to be very, very quickly uh, reuptaked. It's going to be a quick reuptake process via calcium pumps. And you can see the calcium pumps here. So these calcium pumps are going to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to remain there until they're needed again for the next contraction. And this is an active transport mechanism because it, re it requires ATP in order to activate the pump. So let's put this together. So we have this impulse that travels along the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. It will travel down the T-tubules causing a voltage change, okay? A change in the potential difference across membranes. And this will cause the calcium channels, the voltage-gated calcium channels to open, which will cause, to cause calcium to diffuse out of the cell. This triggers a muscle contraction. We'll look at how calcium does this shortly, but a muscle contraction is triggered. After contraction, we don't need the calcium any longer, so they will be actively pumped using ATP back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then the muscle relaxes. So let's kind of back up a little bit for a moment. A skeletal muscle will remain at rest until it's stimulated by a motor neuron. So what does that mean? Well, here is our muscle fiber. You can see that the muscle fiber contains many myofibrils, which contain your myofilaments, right? All of your thick and thin filaments. It has to be stimulated by a motor neuron for anything to happen, meaning that there has to be a nerve muscle connection. And you can see that here. So this is representing a motor nerve and its attachment to the muscle. And it's because of a signal traveling along this nerve that the muscle itself can be stimulated in order for it to contract. So a motor neuron then is the nerve which actually stimulates the muscle. Motor being motor activity, neuron referring to nerve cell. A motor end plate is really this folded region here that allows for the connection. So it's a folded region in the sarcolemma Remember, the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. This folded region is called the motor end plate because it is where you're going to get connection between the motor neuron and the sarcolemma. A neuromuscular junction, sometimes called a synapse, this is the gap that's found between the motor neuron and the muscle. So even though it looks like they're attached, they're not, there's actually a gap all through here, and that's called the neuromuscular junction or the synapse. 
And it's at this location that acetylcholine is going to be released by the nerve. So what happens is a nerve signal travels down this nerve. Once it reaches the end part, which is, is the terminal end, it's going to stimulate these vesicles. These vesicles will then travel to the cell surface of this nerve and release their contents. And their contents is a chemical, which is a neurotrans, this particular one is a neurotransmitter because of its involvement with nerve and transmitting signals, is released from this area and it will pass through this neuromuscular junction, which is actually called the synaptic cleft through here. And it will reach the muscle fiber and this is what will be contributing to the actual ability of a muscle to contract because we need that nerve signal to happen. And we need acetylcholine to be released. And there's a helpful video here to show you an animation on how the neuromuscular junction works. So let's look at all the different parts. We're gonna be putting everything together right now. So starting from the beginning, a nerve impulse reaches the end of a motor neuron. So a nerve impulse is sent along this motor neuron, reaches the end, and it's going to stimulate these vesicles here to release the neurotransmitter that they contain called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will be released, so this vesicle merges with the plasma membrane, releases its contents, and diffuses rapidly across this junction. And this junction, as I mentioned, is called the, the synaptic cleft. It's a cleft in between. It's an actual gap in between where the nerve meets the muscle. Acetylcholine will be released, and you can see it as these purple structures, and it will bind to very specific sites that are found on the sarcolemma of the cell or on the motor end plate. And this will trigger a change. And this change is going to allow for the impulse that had traveled down the nerve to now travel along the muscle fiber. So this impulse can now travel along the muscle fiber, moving along the sarcolemma. It's dipping down. As soon as it gets to a T-tubule, it's going to dip down into that T-tubule, triggering the sarcoplasmic reticulum in that area to release the calcium that it contains into the sarcoplasm where the where we're going to find our contractile units and so you can see all of this calcium here that's been released and it's going to have an effect on this entire contractile unit so when calcium is in the sarcoplasm so it's already been released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum it's going to bind to one of those proteins we spoke about earlier called troponin. Remember, troponin keeps tropomyosin in its place. And we know that tropomyosin is actually covering up those binding sites for my that myosin would like to attach to in a resting state. But when calcium is released, calcium is going to travel to the troponin and it's going to cause a shift or change in position of troponin, which pulls tropomyosin off of its initial site, exposing those binding sites. And now those myosin heads have the ability to attach to the binding sites, forming what we introduced earlier as being called a cross bridge. And it's ATP that gives these myosin heads energy and when ATP actually, remember ATP is stored energy, so it has to hydro, hydrolyze in order to actually utilize that energy where myosin can bind onto the actin binding sites or the myosin binding sites found on actin and begin a contraction. And so here you can see the hydrolyzed, hydrolyzed ATP you can see that myosin is now able to bind to the binding site found on actin. Why? Because calcium bound to troponin, which caused troponin to change its position, pulling with it tropomyosin, exposing these binding sites. And so this will happen repeatedly. So you'll have a myosin head that will attach, 
and then it pulls it in this direction. Then it will release and pull in this direction. And it happens with all of the different myosin heads that are actually attached. They pull, release, pull, release, all with the goal of actually contracting the entire muscle fiber. So this is sometimes called the sliding filament theory or sliding filament model because the filaments themselves are almost sliding in order to produce a contraction. So here we have a resting sarcomere. Rem remember from Z disc to Z disc is one sarcomere. From Z disc to the other Z disc is one sarcomere. And you can see the presence of these thin lines called thin filaments or actin. And then these thicker filaments called myosin that have their myosin heads. And when they can attach to actin, during contraction, the sarcomere shortens. So if you can visualize that this is the distance for this sarcomere, when it's fully contracted, you can tell that it's a lot smaller. And that's because of the work that myosin has done to pull the actin components closer together. So you can see in this image here that actin ended here, but when they're contracted, you can see now there's overlap. And that's because myosin has pulled them closer together which is a muscle contraction. And you can see that it even looks different when you're looking at the actual muscle itself. And here's a video here for contraction and relaxation of sarcomeres. Here's showing you that really it's myosin that's doing all the work in this pulling. So let's summarize this again, but in a different way. So the active sites on actin are exposed when calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and binds to troponin, causing a movement of tropomyosin, exposing these sites. The myosin heads now have the ability to bind to the active sites that are found on actin. The myosin heads will bend and pull the thin filaments, or the actin filaments, towards the center of the sarcomere. So here is the center of the sarcomere, or if we're looking over here, here is the center of the sarcomere, and so the actin filaments, as you can envision from this image here, are being pulled closer to the center of the sarcomere. Each head will then release. So as I told you, it binds, and then it releases, and then it's going to bind to the next available site. So it's working to the myosin filaments stay where they are, but their heads reach up, grab on, pull in, then release, grab up, reach up, attach on and pull in, and this will continue to happen in order to shorten the muscle. And so each myofibril then is shortening. Now in terms of relaxation, we've introduced this already. We said that once calcium has been used and it's not needed anymore and the, the impulse is over, calcium we know will be actively pumped back in via calcium pumps uh, and ATP back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum where it's going to be stored. And so when calcium is removed from its binding site on troponin, and you can look back at a previous slide to recall what's happening with that, then it's going to cause tropo, uh, tro, uh, troposin, troponin, that should be troponin, and tropomyosin to return back to their original position. And so now, once again, those sites that were were available for myosin to bind onto are now going to be blocked again during the resting state. So they cannot bind to actin. And then the contraction, of course, at this point will stop. And the muscle returns to its relaxed state. So we know that ATP is required for muscle contraction, but where does it come from? Well, ATP is the ultimate source of energy. And as I already told you, it's going to be used, the stored energy, when it's hyd hydrolyzed into adenosine diphosphate. And then once we have adenosine diphosphate, then the myosin head is able to actually utilize the energy to bind onto the actin active sites. Now we store some ATP in our muscles that we can use, but it's such a little amount and will exhaust it so quickly. It's only enough for two to four seconds of contraction. And when you think about your daily activities, it's longer than that. So we need other sources of ATP. So ATP can be made constantly from the breakdown of creatinine phosphate. And we're gonna look at this image on the right to see how that happens. 
So after a muscle contraction occurs, we are left with ADP. So this is ADP here, which is adenosine diphosphate, so the two phosphates. This in itself, we can't use for, for later or subsequent muscle contractions. So what happens is that our muscles also have creatinine phosphate in them. And creatinine phosphate's really nice because it donates one of its phosphates to ADP. So it takes its phosphate, donates it, and forms ATP. So because of creatinine phosphate donating a phosphate, we can take this phosphate, add it to adenosine diphosphate, and now form ATP again, which is stored energy. We also get energy from glucose in the blood. So in our diet, when we consume food, carbohydrates can, will be broken down into glucose, and we can use that glucose to produce energy via processes such as glycolysis and the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. We can also get energy from glycogen in muscle. So glycogen is a stored form of glucose. So glucose can be stored in our body in the form of glycogen. And so if we need glucose for energy to produce ATP, because glucose is the primary source that we use to produce ATP, then glycogen can be broken down to yield its glucose components so that we can make ATP with it. So depending on the situation, we have different pathways that exist. We have aerobic pathways and we have anaerobic pathways. Aerobic, when you see this term, think of oxygen because this occurs when adequate oxygen is available from the blood. We will go through aerobic pathways when oxygen is present. This process is considered to be slower than the anaerobic pathway, but it gives us longer term supplies rather than short-term supplies. And so the opposite then can be said about anaerobic pathways, that they're very fast, but they're very fast, so they're gonna give us energy only really during the first few minutes of aerobic, of uh, exercise rather. And with anaerobic, it doesn't require oxygen, and oxygen can be low and meaning lack of. So the lack of oxygen or low oxygen can permit the anaerobic pathways from occurring. And so you can see in this graph that the aerobic energy yield takes a lot longer, but we will get more sustained energy. But when it comes to the anaerobic pathway, you could see it gives energy real quick, but it drops off very quickly. And so we can summarize that a little bit more by looking at this bottom graph here. And really what this is designed to do is show you that during the first 10, 30, and 60 seconds, we have mostly an anaerobic pathway, 90%, 80%, 70%, 70 whereas much less of our, of our aerobic pathway takes, in, takes place. But then once we get into more so minutes of maximal exercise, you can see that we're depleting now our anaerobic pathway. It's not being used as much. And so the percentage of contribution reduces. Whereas you can see now, once we're into minutes or longer of exercise, you can see that we're using our aerobic pathway as oxygen becomes available. So this can be the difference between a quick sprint and a long steady jog. We've already discussed that muscles or we could say skeletal muscle organs, we can use the term organ when referring to our muscles, are bundles of muscle fibers, right? These are the cells that are held together by a fibrous connective tissue. We've already gone into all of that detail. But you should also know that we can produce very large global movements on a day-to-day -day basis, but we can also produce very small fine movements. Now, how is this possible? Well, it comes down to a motor unit. Now, what are the components of a motor unit? A motor unit consists of a motor neuron, which we know is the nerve cell itself, and the muscle fibers that it innervates. So here's a motor neuron, and you can see that inner, this one innervates two, three, four, five different muscle fibers. And so this collectively 
is called a motor unit, the motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates or supplies or forms a neuromuscular junction with. And so the purpose is for controlled muscle movement, right? Innervating many different areas allows for more control. But the number of muscle fibers that exist in each motor unit is going to vary depending on what area of the body it's in, for example. So when you have a motor unit, okay, so this whole structure, the motor neuron and the muscle fibers that it innervates, that only innervates a few muscle fibers, like in this case here, this is going to be responsible for more small, precise movements. But when it comes to motor units where there are thousands of different muscle fibers that are innervated, this is going to produce, as you could probably suspect, more powerful, stronger movements. So if you were to help somebody uh, to move something, you're going to need the motor units with many that have many muscle fibers innervated by it, by the motor neuron, to allow for those powerful, strong movements. So let's talk a little bit about muscle tone. Muscle tone, we introduced posture a little bit in a previous class, but muscle tone is the continual partial contraction of a muscle. And this is maintained by feedback mechanisms. So for example, if you are starting to slouch, your body will, will correct for that to some extent via negative feedback mechanisms. And so muscle tone can be defined as at any one time, a small number of muscle fibers within a muscle contract and produce tightness or tone of that muscle at any one time. The term flaccid, muscles that have a, um, say less tone than normal are considered to be flaccid muscles, where if you have more tone, and this term might be familiar to you, then muscles tend to be, uh, are considered to be spastic because they have, they have more tone than is considered normal. So more of this continual partial contraction. In this image, you can see a person carrying a box. And so we're gonna talk about what's called the stretch, the stretch reflex. And the purpose of the stretch reflex is to maintain constant length as load is increased up to a maximal point, of course. So in this image, you see a, a person that's carrying a load and they're right now able to sustain that load quite nicely. But then all of a sudden, someone comes in and adds another box onto that load. What you'll see happening then is an increase in load, of course, but the muscle length will change because now all of a sudden you can see that instead of holding her forearms at 90 degrees, now they're starting to drop down. So you're getting a stretch. But this stretch is actually detected by stretch receptors that are found within the muscle being stretched. So these are called muscle spindles. And they will send this message back to our spinal cord, which will look at the information and decide, okay, we need to increase contraction in order to hold this additional weight. And so it's gonna send out a message back to the muscle, signaling it to contract, bringing us back to homeostasis, where now we can hold the load, even though there's two boxes. And of course, this happens only to a maximal point where eventually the uh, fatigue will set in or it will be dangerous to your muscle and then your body will sort of abandon what it's doing. But in normal cases, when there is even just a slight increase in the variable, it will be detected by muscle spindles. They pick up this stretch that happens as the muscle lengthens and then a signal will be sent out to contract the muscle more so that we can bring us back to the point where we were at. And that's all summarized within this statement on the left of your slide. Okay, let's have a look at the two main types of contractions. We have isotonic contractions and isometric contractions. The term iso, when you see this, this refers to the same. Tonic is referring to tension. So this is referring to same tension, whereas isometric refers to same and metric is referring to length, so same length. So what does all of this mean? 
With isotonic contractions, the tone or the tension is going to remain the same as already stated while the muscle length itself is changing. So the length changes, but the tone remains the same. And the two different types that exist include concentric contractions and eccentric. And if you've ever exercised before, these might be familiar terms, or if you've taken a personal training course, for instance. With concentric, the muscle itself shortens as it contracts. Okay, so the concentric part, the actual contraction, so it is shortening as it contracts. So here's an example here. As somebody's doing a bicep curl, their bicep muscle is going to shorten, and this is called an isotonic contraction, but a concentric contraction. Whereas eccentric is the opposite. The muscle actually lengthens while it's contracting. So for example, if the ball is up here and now we're bringing it back down, this muscle is still contracting, but it's lengthening. Whereas in the case of a, an isometric contraction, the muscle length itself remains the same instead of changing like it did with isotonic. And tension here is increasing, so they're, they're quite opposite to each other. So this person is actually holding this bar here and contracting their muscle, but there's not actual movement. So we're not going in this direction and we're not going in this direction. And that's a method some people will use for exercising is holding a particular position to exercise their muscles. And most of the body movements that occur within us are a result of both types of contractions. So involving isotonic as well as isometric. And on this final slide, there are different conditions that can affect the strength of a muscle contraction. So looking at count, uh, clockwise here, at the top, there could be metabolic conditions. Uh, let's say you've been exercising for quite some time already and your muscles are starting to fatigue. When your muscles fatigue because you've been at the gym for an hour, you could imagine then that the strength of muscle contraction would be reduced. How many muscle fibers are actually activated or how many motor units are involved can also determine the strength of contraction. So if you have a motor unit that has many different muscle fibers that are innervated by a motor neuron, then it's going to produce a stronger contraction than if you have a motor neuron that only innervates you know, three, four, or five muscle fibers. So go back to one of our previous slides to recall that. The other consideration is what is the initial length of the muscle? Was it partially contracted already, which could affect the overall strength, or was it relaxed? What was the load at that time? How much stretch did it apply to the muscle? These are just examples. And then finally, the amount of load, which I sort of introduced just uh, a moment ago, having to do with your stretch reflex, where your body will know if something is too heavy. And if, it, if it's heavy, but you can still manage it, then an increase in, in contraction strength will occur. But if it gets so heavy that it's damaging to your body, then you will, you will abandon the load in order to prevent damage. That's all for today's lecture. Thank you for listening.